My name is Emily and I'm with WWF Canada's Nature Connected Communities team. This is our second Garden for Wildlife webinar and we're so excited that you could join us today. The next hour, our panel of experts is gonna give you the dirt on native plants and give you eight steps for you to really dig into your gardens and get planting. So just to let you know, this is our second webinar in the Garden for Wildlife series. We have four more webinars coming up. They happen on Tuesdays and Saturdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And if you're looking to sign up for them, you can go to wwf.ca and you'll see a box on our homepage where you can see the full list of webinars and register there. So before we get going today, we just wanna ask you a couple of questions to get to know you a little bit better. So the first question is how many of you were able to come to our first webinar that happened on Tuesday of this week? Okay, so I'm checking out the answers here. Just give you a couple more seconds to bring those in. So it looks like we have a pretty even split here. About 60% of you were able to come to the last webinar and 41% of you are joining us for the first time today. I'm gonna see those results here. That is awesome. So we'd also like to know where everybody is joining us from. Um, because native plants are native to your location. So knowing where you guys are is gonna help us today to tailor our talk a little bit. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna give you guys a couple more seconds to get in your answers. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people today are joining us from Ontario. And we have some people here from BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Quebec, and as well as the East Coast. All right, so before we get into things, I just wanna take a second to address COVID-19. We know that many of us are really getting into our gardens right now because it's something that we can do at home, it's active and it's good for our mental health. But we wanna make sure that when we're going out and we're purchasing plants that we're following public health guidelines. So we would just like to say that when you can to order your seeds and supplies online, do curbside pickup, or if you're going to a store to make a list so that you can go in and can be efficient and you don't have to make too many extra trips out. Um, and I'd also just like to acknowledge um, Carolinian Canada. Um, ben, who's here with us today, is with Carolinian Canada, and WWF has been partnering with them for a couple of years now on a program called In the Zone Gardens. So what that does is we're helping thousands of gardeners in Southern Ontario's Carolinian Zone to restore habitat by planting native plants. So I'm sure many of you today are probably members um, of the In the Zone program. So I'm just going to take a poll here and just see how many of you um, are part of the In the Zone program and have registered your garden with us and how many of you have not. Okay, I'll just give you a couple more seconds to submit your answers. Okay. 
Okay, so as you can see, we have a fairly even split here, but 44% of you have registered within the zone, which is awesome. You're helping us to track how much habitat we're restoring. In Ontario, you know, 56% are not currently registered in the program, but I would encourage you if you were interested in contributing to citizen science and adding your garden to our goal of growing Canada's wildlife garden, largest wildlife garden, that you um, just visit um, in the zonegardens.ca and we'll be sharing that link throughout the presentation. You can see it on the bottom of the slides. And yeah, you'll be helping contribute to a really important citizen science effort. And I'd also like to extend a big thank you to Loblaws. They've been an important champion of our In the Zone Gardens program. They've been working with local growers to have native plants available in some of their locations in Southern Ontario. Um, and we'll have more information about that probably later next week. Um, and if you sign up within the zone, we'll be able to send you information about where to get native plants. So um, I just want to introduce you guys to our expert panel today. You may, if you came to our last webinar, you will recognize them. We have Pete Ewens, he's our lead species specialist with World Wildlife Fund Canada. He has worked with World Wildlife Fund for over 20 years, including doing Arctic conservation. And currently he works with us in urban settings to restore nature in these densely populated areas where people are interacting with wildlife and species all of the time. Um, so Pete, um, just to get, let everyone get to know you, um, the question, so why did you get started with native plants? Well, I'm a lifelong conservationist, uh, and I've known forever that nature rules and native plants are what nature evolved. So they are the very best for food webs. And I believe in allowing nature to do its thing in support of us. So native plants are the best. Why wouldn't you go for the best? Awesome. Thank you so much, Pete. And next up, I'd like to introduce everyone to Ryan Godfrey. He works on World Wildlife Fund Canada's Nature Connected Communities team. He is a botanist and he's also on the board of the North American Native Plant Society. So at Ryan, can you just say hi to everybody and just tell us what you've been doing in your garden recently? Thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. Yeah, my name's Ryan. Um, and what I've been up to out on my balcony is planting some containers um, and putting some seeds in the ground, some, some beans and whatnot, um, and uh, just looking at all the wonderful things popping up that survived from last year, which is pretty fun. Thank you, Ryan. And lastly, I'd like to introduce everybody to Ben Porchak. As I mentioned, he is an ecologist with Caroline in Canada and he's um, with us from London, Ontario, where he has a really incredible native plant garden where he has more than 200 species of native plants. Um, so Ben, I'm wondering if you could share with everybody your favorite gardening story, and I'm here it involves dragonflies. Yes, thanks Emily, and hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, <clears throat> it was right when I started to dig in the, the subject of today's webinar, and I had the liner down in my big pond system, and I kept hearing something as I was looking down and working and I finally looked up and it was the largest dragonfly in North America, the swamp darner. And I called my friend who's an expert and, and he said, she's trying to lay eggs, get some wood down in the water. As soon as I put down a log, she was laying eggs in the liner that was half full of water. So it really is put it in there and watch everything return. It's just amazing. Thank you, Ben. And I'm going to turn it over to Pete now, who's going to give us some background on why native plants are just so important for protecting biodiversity. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. Um, very useful to have this poll. So uh, I, of course, as I revealed in my answer to Emily's question, uh, I believe totally in nature being given half a chance, because ultimately our existence depends on nature. Um, I would encourage you to uh, put questions in the Q&A room or the chat room and we'll try and get to those after the presentation and just fire away that gives us a good record. Anyway, there we are. Canada is a massive country, second biggest with many eco zones and 
the native plant species, of course, and the soils that they live in, you know, underpin everything that lives, eats, sleeps and breathes above it. That's all well and good, except there's uh, 8 billion of us. And uh, we unfortunately have been uh, not valuing nature the way um, most of us do. So we currently have what was called a dual crisis. Uh, three or four months ago, it became a triple crisis. Uh, massive biodiversity loss, even over uh, my lifetime. Rapid, unprecedented climate change. And now, of course, um, the first pandemic for just over 100 years. So this triple crisis is, has stopped humanity in its tracks. That's bad news. The good news is there are a lot of solutions how to deal with that. We know a lot uh, underpinned by science. And one of those solutions is what's now called nature-based solutions. And so it's kind of back to nature, back to the sustainable basics. So native plants are at the heart of this because scenes like this and any other uh, habitat, terrestrially or marine, if it's intact, is a huge way to absorb carbon and to host thousands and thousands of species that are useful to us in many different ways. So putting that back in a world that's heavily uh, fragmented and degraded is a big part of the answer. So for us, it's native plants, the ones that evolved in that region to help what we call grow Canada's biggest wildlife garden. And as we'll see in a few minutes, that can be in all of your local green spaces, including your balcony and yard. And ultimately rolling all this together, this actually for all of us uh, will help restore natural habitats. And of course we're protecting the best of the bigger spaces that are left. So that is the nature-based solution framing for what we're doing globally as a major conservation organization, nationally here. And the next slide, Emily, thanks. Of course, wherever you are in Canada, and good morning to uh, you in BC, welcome. There are across southern Canada, seven terrestrial ecozones where 90% uh, plus of Canadians live. Uh, we're going to drill into the orange one, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Mixwood Forest System, but these same things apply very much to uh, all Southern Canadian urban and peri-urban habitats, what people can do to establish a native plant garden. We piloted this program called In the Zone uh, to be applicable in any of these ecozones, actually. But we piloted it right here in Southern Ontario, where for 35 years, Carolinian Canada, as an organization WWF created uh, 35 years ago, has functioned very well to try and protect and make people aware of this biodiversity hotspot. Um, it's, it's Canada's biggest biodiversity hotspot. Third of Canada's species and species at risk are concentrated here between Toronto and Windsor. And of course, quarter of Canada's human population lives here too. So 97% of this landscape has been converted in 200 years from its natural state uh, to commercial agriculture, infrastructure and cities. But this eco region within uh, the, this terrestrial ecozone is really a crucible for us of how to restore and put these nature-based solutions into practice. Next slide. This program has uh, a key thing in it called a tracker, which it's an online thing. And uh, of course, many people were already doing some of this native plant habitat restoration in their gardens or balconies. Um, others became interested in it because we started communicating the benefits. And uh, this tracker allows us to collect numbers, both each individual doing it through their computer or phone, uh, but also us rolling it up for the whole eco region. So um, recently, these are the numbers after three and a half years, uh, over 60,000 native plants have been actually planted in through this program and its quantification that uh, adds up to nearly 28,000 hectares of land across these different urban areas and uh, actually now it's just over 5,000 people uh, are helping out in this part of Canada to grow Canada's biggest wildlife garden so 
particularly enhanced by the uh, the recent uh, restriction to people's <laughs> lifestyles, uh, people are very interested uh, in doing some more useful things in their home space, their garden and their, uh, their balconies. And of course, that's why um, vegetable seeds are selling out and there's a huge demand even before COVID for native plant material because it produces fantastic uh, responses in terms of pollinators and other wildlife species that evolved here. So that's the In the Zone program. Next slide. Now, when I talk to any audience, um, major companies, schools, academics, uh, local groups, uh, they are very interested in this slide in particular. It, for me, summarizes best why you should actually pay attention to native plants. Of course, there are increased benefits in terms of the biodiversity that comes within hours of these wonderful plants flowering, increased ecosystem resilience, increased storage of carbon because these plants have roots that are normally three or four feet deep to survive these hot dry climates in southern Canada. Um, so you've got a lot of water retention, you've got a lot of carbon storage, you've got a lot of shade from these things too which helps reduce your um, heating and cooling, well cooling bills especially in summer and particularly in our modern world I mean the, the, the human emotion that pours out when people see these things, whether you're young or old, human well-being factor goes through the roof when you have at least a small patch of these plants in your garden. But also key in the left-hand column is the massive, if not complete, reduction in use of pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and watering once these native plant gardens are established. You don't need to put any of those on. In fact, it's better if you don't. And then the maintenance effort is significantly reduced and the costs of doing all that, well, you just need to know how much you spend every year on trying to keep that goddamn lawn and all those petunias and dahlias alive. So there it is, many, many co-benefits of these plants. And of course, as wildlife organizations, we are primarily interested in helping the diversity of wildlife that essentially drives our world, but, and allows pollinators to pollinate our food plants, but this is much broader than that. Next slide. So this is just an example of what I call joining up the green dots. So the ravines and small parks in the Toronto and Hamilton or any other uh, Southern Ontario uh, region, in between those green patches are lots of people's gardens and places. And that is what people are realizing they can be much smarter with the ground cover there. You don't have to have concrete asphalt and uh, exotic plants and Kentucky bluegrass because they do actually virtually nothing for biodiversity and they cost a lot to maintain. So that's it. It's a connection of ecological patches together so that these insects and birds that fly can actually hop from one patch to the next. And it's about connecting people to the natural world again, even in the urban ecosystem. Next picture. Okay, this is my reminder. My North American mentor, Doug Ptolemy, who's uh, really a student of E.O. Wilson, he reminds us that uh, nature needs our help. And more than ever, we need nature. Uh, it is these insects and other creatures in those lower parts of the food chain that keep us alive. And those are actually in steep decline. This picture I just discovered is of a curve lined owlet uh, caterpillar, which is the most bizarre caterpillar I have ever not seen. And it lives just south of here. And Ben managed to tell me yesterday I predicted with climate change, it might, as we start connecting up these, it might actually one day be able to see this in Ontario before I keel over. Well, blow me. Last year, now there are two records in Canada, both in Southern Ontario, of this amazing creature. So for me, this has become my symbol of what can happen. Yes, we can. Next slide. So it's remarkable in my own garden how quickly once these things flower, 
wildlife comes, hummingbirds, of course, butterflies, bees, and numerous bees, hundreds of species that I actually don't know how to identify, but you can have great fun trying to identify them with uh, citizen science, iNaturalist, and other apps. Next slide. So there's great results wherever your little green patch is, whether you're a new homeowner, a new subdivision, a factory, office, roof, balcony, uh, curbside garden, all of these situations invite the replacement of exotic plants or mud and concrete with a few native plants and you will see these benefits and be helping grow Canada's biggest wildlife garden. So that's, that's why it's easy that uh, this, this is just running away um, from the supply right now of native plants. So we can do this. This uh, webinar is about helping to tell you how to get started if you haven't already made a start. Next slide. This is the structure for today. Uh, we split it into eight sections. Uh, the previous webinar uh, was on uh, coming up with your plan, the basics of planning that will be posted on www.ca soon. And these other key sections will be covered um, by a range of us. Follow your plan, followed by the critical preparing the ground and being aware of the soils that drive the plants that you're going to put in, where to get your plants, number three, the right material really does count. What are your options? What gear do I need? Number four, how do I go about planting to get started and establish this garden and what time of year? What do I do in the early stages to keep weeds at bay? And number seven, one of Ben's specialties, as you can see from his back cloth there, watering and wetlands. So he's going to cover that. And then the final one, uh, Ryan will finish it off with uh, talking about labeling, recording, and then a wrap up and resources. So next slide, please. So last time we helped underscore we think uh, the importance of planning and taking stock of what you've got already what your neighbors have got the context coming up with a plan a bit of drawing a bit of uh, numbers and things on paper and then you're ready to go so follow your plan is the first thing here fish it out and make a start next slide I think is my handover to Ben. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Pete. Thanks so much for speaking clearly, slowly, easy to understand, and with that great accent that really set me up for, <laughs> for being calm. So talking about soils, um, and I think, yeah, there you go. Emily added, and don't treat it like dirt. A lot of people use that term, dirt for soil, and soils are really complex. They're highly varied. They have different um, layers. They have different horizons. And a lot of people will know from rainforests that we have a beautiful humus layer, which is pretty much uh, the majority of the soil that you find there. Whereas in Canada, of course, across the amazing country, uh, we've got sand and clay and loam and you know rocky soils. We have so much, so many different options. So I'm gonna go through um, Kind of setting up your soils for what you're looking for perfect timing for the slide this slide was in last week's webinar but i didn't have the the words on there this is actually from my front yard in a native plant garden that has been a woodland for uh, almost 14 years now and it's rich uh, you'll notice the kind of messiness which is that humus layer the leaves the the sticks uh, things like earthworms, which surprisingly in southern Ontario, we didn't have native until a couple hundred years ago. They will chew through pretty quickly and convert a lot of these dead leaves and twigs and everything into soil pretty quickly. But what a lot of people don't recognize is that it's actually plants that create the soil. So the plants have an offering. It's a sticky offering at the tips of their roots. It's called exudates. I know Ryan loves that word. And it's got protein, carbohydrates, and sugars, and it attracts bacteria and fungi. And this is critical because without the bacteria and the fungi, there isn't aeration in the soil. There isn't a stickiness. So the plant will actually hold in place uh, to really withstand uh, big torrential rains and um, creates aeration. And, but most importantly, it can, 
converts nutrients so that the plants can take up these nutrients, immobilize them. And then there are actually other predators, other microbes will come in and attack the bacteria and the fungi, trying to get to the plant root system. And when some of those bacteria and fungi die, they actually turn into minerals that the plants can take up. So without this, without the plants offering this incredible source to the incredible diversity that's underneath the soil level, we just don't, the soil um, surface, we don't really get the diversity. So the most diversity in an ecosystem is always below the surface layer. And uh, so I'm gonna look at now a few different slides of what you might be looking for. So the, the first slide, is if you're out on the prairies or if you're in extreme southern Ontario near Windsor, if you're looking for this prairie type of habitat, you're pretty fortunate because most prairies, whether it's short grass, mixed or, or tall grass prairie, they don't really need a lot of nutrients. So you can sand, gravel, uh, very poor soils, even in areas with limestone or, or sometimes near, near granite, you can have prairies flourish. And what a lot of people don't recognize, they, they often want um, kind of a mo more mature habitat. Well, some of these plants that you see here on the left-hand side, they can live for a hundred years. And this is a photograph from uh, an average nursery. You know, maybe two thirds of these plants are native. And, and so, you know, it's okay if you have some plants that aren't native to leave them in there. But just to know that you don't really have to do a lot of work up to get a prairie established. If you do have rich soils, you'll have woody plants coming in and colonizing quickly. So you'll have to do some maintenance there. Next slide. That's butterfly milkweed at the bottom and then that other one's Ohio spiderwort. So for the woodland, you are going to want a richer soil. And again, this, this takes a while. When I first put in my native plant garden about 12 years ago, it's a lot of the plants I invested in these trilliums. And uh, you know, I, I, I think I bought each trillium for $12 and I bought 10. So it was a big investment starting out for somebody who is you know, relatively new land owner, first time homeowner. Uh, they didn't do very well. They, uh, most of them died because the soils weren't quite ready. And without that bacteria and fungi and that diversity, they have a hard time getting established. So have some patience. If you wanna build it up, uh, you can find a way to uh, get rid of that Kentucky bluegrass, which is actually native to Europe and Asia. You can cover it up, bring in a lot of leaves from your neighbors, or maybe you have trees yourself, uh, really start to build up that upper layer. And pretty soon the earthworms and other things will start to create soil, but mo most importantly, these native plants will. And so if you look at the slide here, we've got uh, maidenhair fern at the bottom left, jack in the pulp at the top, top left, and then there are some trilliums that are pink. Uh, and then on the right is blue beaded lily. Next slide, just in case you're interested. And this slide here I thought was a little later on because this is a ground cover. And we talk about a lot of the non-native plants that are around us. Um, from our neighbors, or maybe it's established in your old, own garden, things like goutweed, English ivy. This one's uh, an amazing alternative. It's called partridge berry. And on the left there, that's a zoom in with the beautiful flowers. In the bottom right, you can see the edible berry. And then the top right is what it looks like when it, when it covers. And I, I had this in here originally for ground cover and soils because a lot of rain and wind, if we have big patches of exposed soil, it will start to erode that and wash it away and really defeat what we're trying to do. So getting a great native ground cover established is pretty critical for, for gardening and uh, for wildlife. Next slide. And of course, wetlands here. This is my wetland several years after established in my backyard. Um, it's got 25 species of native plants. Some of them are woodland, most of them are wetland. We're talking about soils and really digging in. One of the key things that you have to do if you're going to invest in a wetland, of course you wanna plan for it, but you've gotta make sure you can hold water because if you don't hold water, then you have exposed liner or you have big areas of exposed uh, soil and sand and it becomes a pit and it's actually dangerous for wildlife. So if you're, um, if you're not into um, engineering and I'm not talking like fourth year engineering at a university, 
um, you know, plan, consult with people or hire somebody if you really want water. Water is just not an incredible thing that brings in wildlife when it's migrating or local wildlife to drink. But when you have running water, you get that sense of peace. And if you're in the city and you can hear traffic, just bring your chair up to the wetland and you can hear the water flowing. And there's all sorts of research that talks about how this calms us and really gets us in the zone. <laughs> Next slide. Of course, that's my little solar light. Yeah, so some of the things we could have had this slide earlier, but we have it now. If you're looking at ways of uh, removing some of that Kentucky bluegrass or some of the other non-native grasses that we buy that are called lawn, uh, you can do things called solarization. So you can put down black plastic or tarps and with rocks to hold them down. And when you do that, there no sunlight can get through. And so all of those, um, the, those grass plants and some of the others uh, they die and you can establish uh, your garden without too much competition from some of the plants that want to come up. And weed suppression, you can also do it with thick layers of mulch or even really thick layers of, of leaves, which is what I do. And I put on heavy leaves because so many people are, are throwing them out curbside um, that those people that I know don't have invasive species in their weed bags that could have seeds, I will actually take some of those, especially if they're oak leaves because oak leaves have tannins in them and they're actually resistant to decay. So they'll put down a really nice mat that can prevent the growth of, of plants that you don't want. And we used to call those weeds. And now we call them plants that we don't want because every plant is beautiful and it has its place in the world. Okay, next slide. All right, so some of the non-native vegetation is actually woody, things like uh, European buckthorn, uh, some of the, the plums and the other ornamentals. Uh, this is a good friend of mine around the corner and I've been giving him a hand lately and doing some videos of the before and the after. And I actually have a little YouTube channel where I'm, I've posted the very beginning when he started this spring and we're gonna track this garden. Pretty critical to remove these, you know, to give more light and to allow some of the native plants to have access. Next slide. Okay, I think this is me. I'm stepping up for the uh, plant material section. Um, so this is one of the questions we get most often from people is about how am I going to get these plants? Um, and until recently, it's it's been a bit of a barrier for people because they might have to go quite far to a specialized native plant nursery, which is why we're very excited um, to talk about um, WWF's partnership with Loblaws and this spring, for the first time, uh, in 35 garden centers throughout southern Ontario, there will be the very best locally sourced and ethically sourced pesticide-free native plants available in garden centers. Now, I have to reiterate that at the time of recording, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, and so garden centers will not be looking exactly the same as they always do. Um, Loblaws is taking this pandemic very seriously and have put in place measures so that um, physical distancing will be respected between customers, but they are opening and there will be native plants in these garden centers. How fantastic. Um, and stay tuned to learn exactly which centers and when the plants will be available. Next slide, please. Okay, another way to get started um, that is cost effective and relatively low effort is with seeds. Um, and this slide is here to sort of be a bit of a warning because not all seed packets are created equally. Um, and it's, it's very important to know where the seeds are coming from, which species are in there. I'll just say a quick anecdote that I got one of those um, Cheerios seed packets that went around with no label on it whatsoever about what was inside. Being a botanist, I of course sorted the seeds, photographed them and grew them and learned that of all the species in there, none were native to my region. Five were not even native to my continent. Three of those were fast spreading plants and one was actually an invasive species. So please be very careful about your seed packets and ask those questions. Where are these plants from? Where are the original source populations? Because you may be doing more harm than good. Next slide, please. 
of course, there is a right way to do this, and that involves partnering with ecologists, getting permits from uh, public landowners, and harvesting seeds in a way where many are left um, in nature for wildlife to consume or for the plants to regenerate their own populations. And through In the Zone, we've been doing exactly that, sending those seeds to nurseries to be grown and also packaging them in certain cases for our, our seed packets. And it's one of our favorite things to do and we'll of course be continuing to do that in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, there are a couple of important things to know about native perennial seeds. Many people think of spring as the time for seeding, but for us native plant gardeners, it's actually the fall. Um, because the natural cycles of nature are such that many of the seeds that drop in the fall would naturally undergo um, a cold period over winter where they freeze and then they'll germinate in the spring when the thaws come. So we, we can simulate that um, and do just what's pictured here. So you can put plant uh, seedlings, little seeds out in the fall in trays. They're being protected right now so they won't be eaten by birds or mammals because we're looking for the highest yield possible in this case. Um, and then they go through winter and they come up in the spring. Wonderful. Um, next slide, please. You can also do this in your garden beds, by the way, or containers, it works too. Another way to do it is indoors through a process called cold moist stratification, which is essentially um, putting your seeds in a sealed plastic bag or other container between layers of moistened paper towel. And if you keep them in the fridge, which is approximately um, you know, four degrees or so, win good wintry temperatures for um, six weeks or so is usually what I do. Um, depends on the species, then after six weeks you can pull them out and treat them like any old other kind of seed. You can grow them in propagation trays like this, you can put them outside and they will germinate. So that's a good way to do that. Next slide please. And with that we'll pass on to the next section. Pete, we can't hear you. Sorry, thank you. Um, the gear that you need, uh, even if you've been doing this for 15 years or so, like uh, Ben and I, is really quite limited and not expensive. Um, it's the range of things there, some of which are hidden, but anyway, uh, it's, it's simple, you know, shovel, um, some pots, uh, wire labels, and some potting soil, and really you just need to collate that as you're thinking about actually getting into the garden and doing the work. Um, if some of the places have tool libraries, you can buy most of these things at um, garden centers, Home Depot when they're open, um, or you can borrow some, get some from your neighbors, etc. or ask Santa Claus some for Christmas, but it's, it's not expensive and that's pretty much it. Next slide. So I'm going to just talk about some of the basic elements of actual planting. And of course, as Ben said, at this time of year, everybody's got five months of cabin fever under their belt and normally <laughs> would be going out even without uh, COVID restrictions. So planting is a great thing to do in the spring, get some dirt under your fingernails. But really the fall is the best time to plant, but we can't get over that reality that people want to get out and do something, plant and grow in the spring. So next slide. You can actually plant in the summer as well, but the drawback in summer where most people live in Canada is that uh, it's fairly hot and dry. And so you just need to do a lot more watering and being much more vigilant about your little tender seedlings that are uh, needing attention to survive right through. Of course, if you're in the spring, next slide, then you don't plant seeds uh, of these native perennials because they have 
not had that stratification, the cold treatment. So you're going to a nursery or you're from somebody else getting some plant material. If it's big, like the blue beech on the left there down in a park restoration in Windsor, you have to dig a big hole and you might want to put some compost or rooting compound in the bottom. But really um, that hole I think would be at least twice or if not one or one and a half two times the size and then you put your your root in you pack it down and around and then the mulch on the top is to retain the water and prevent weeds coming up more common here in smaller gardens in the city is uh, the potted plants four inch pots or one gallon pots are simple just uh, dig your hole and compact it down carefully make sure the roots are pulled apart a little bit and then water 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 they want to settle down with, with water and um, that's pretty much it. So similar technique, diff different holes, sizes, of course. Next slide. So if, you're, if you've got native plant seeds, either you've bought some from a quality nursery or as Ryan's uh, was talking about, you've got them from uh, a sustainably harvested uh, local source, even from your yard. You can scatter them in the fall, you scarify the ground. This is a, a senior's home where we just created um, very quickly uh, a native plant garden which flourished. And a lot of that was from seed that I collected from my garden with a um, little loose covering of, of um, soil and then leaves. Next slide. Leaves are tremendous protection as Ben was saying. Just leave them there. To, to protect that surface. Really you're simul mimicking nature and those leaves through the microbial and insect worm action will just um, recycle the nutrients right through. And the seeds will germinate having been through a winter as they come up and that's happening right now in many of the gardens as we speak, early spring. Next slide. There's the same slide uh, to emphasize mulching here, of course, it does help once you've planted uh, in the spring, say, to stop the baking and the evaporation, transpiration of water out of that soil horizon through a long hot summer. You still need to do some watering, but it just keeps the water in there by putting this cap on and suppresses, reduces the uh, incursion of, of weeds. But of course, there are downsides to ongoing mulching, which um, Ben and Ryan has genuine botanists understand much better than me, but uh, most of us don't use mulching uh, long term. It helps get things established, but there are negative effects of leaching from that uh, concentrated wood chip in the soil, etc. So see if they can find the cardinal in there. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. And as you're doing that, of course, don't forget about those insects and this was new to me uh, a couple of years ago but it's true in Canada as well but 70 percent of North America's native bee species actually need bare ground access to nest so you there's a classic example that this um, bumblebee species has found some bare ground among some leaves that's an ideal situation and bumblebees are the very best most effective pollinators of all so Leave a bit of bare ground as you're doing all this busy planting. Next. And one thing I call these fusion gardens, but you can take a bed that's full of exotic plants uh, and just create a bit of space and plant and or seed in. And it's remarkable what you can achieve. This was a, a youth uh, shelter home in North Toronto, which uh, the very next summer produced this array of native plants on the right. So don't give up. You don't have to take away all of your annual and perennial cultivated ex exotic plants. Just try and find a space in between to get started. Next slide. And speaking of weeding, Ryan. All right, over to me. Um, I have a lot of things that I'd like to say about weeding and I'll be talking more about this in the fourth episode of this series about maintenance. Um, but for now, I just wanted to flag that I cannot count 
the number of times that people tell me that they accidentally pulled up their baby native plants because they didn't know what they were, they thought they were weeds. So I just want to say, it's okay, resist that urge. When you see the little things popping up, if you're not sure what it is, and remember those first two leaves that show up called the cotyledons, they look the same for basically all plants. So you won't really know until the third leaf comes out. Um, it's okay to just leave it and learn and figure it out, identify, and then figure out what to do. Because you may have free little baby plants that self-seeded or that came in from the nursery. Um, so just, just, just leave it alone and you'll be fine. Okay, next slide, please. That is unless you have these things. Um, of course, invasive species defined as exotic plants that spread so much that they do economic harm, particularly in crop fields and um, in drainage uh, systems, water drainage, uh, but they also uh, can create dangerous monocultures in natural systems. So if you see any of these plants, and I'm sure you know many of them, it's going to be, this is your mountain to climb. <laughs> um, I highly recommend visiting the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's website or the Invasive Species Center, um, which is a federally relevant, um, both of which have very in-depth best practices for removing these things, but I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be an easy road. So as you're just chipping away at these things, remember that it's important to also plant those native plants back. And really, my last point on this is that as long as we have weakened, degraded, and destroyed ecosystems with niches available to be filled, these invasive plants will just keep coming back. So it's so important that we do everything that we can to increase the overall health of our landscape so that they don't get essentially infected by invasive species. Next slide, please. Um, okay, moving on to Ben for the next section. Okay, I'm on. Here we go, the sound is on. So this is um, water areas and, and wetlands. And the reason why this is uh, so important from my perspective is, you know, this slide alone, this is from a neighbor's wetland just across one street over. And he actually just moved to uh, Calgary where he's a professor now um, in restoration ecology. So he was really well suited to build this beautiful wetland and his kids played in this pond a lot. And they really are something that attracts wildlife so quickly and they're so highly varied and there are many different types of wetlands, but for the most part, I'll be talking about ponds here. And we'll start off with the next slide that looks at something that all of us usually kind of contend with. And this is water that's running off our buildings. This is a cross section, Ryan reminded me to say this. And uh, Pete reminded me that there isn't actually a liner here. If you have a good detailed look at this cross section, you've actually got different types of aggregates, uh, some soil, uh, some smaller, uh, uh, larger, smaller boulders at the top, um, some also some mulch, but importantly, some native wetland plants and some plants that are, you know, in between wetland plants and woodland plants that don't mind being soaked. And the other thing about this slide here is that you're only seeing uh, two of the dimensions, right? There's a third dimension where this actually tapers and runs to the level of your, your yard at some point so that the water that's coming through here will be slowed down and absorbed by the plants and the gravel, slowly go back into the aquifer instead of racing off your roof, causing erosion. And you know this is the challenge that we have in a lot of our cities and towns is that so much hard top that the water gets speed, doesn't get absorbed, and we have major flooding issues. So this is pretty critical. It's, um, it's not very big, but it's very effective. And then of course, uh, when you're watering things, why not have these, um, the ability on the right there, this is from Pete's house, I think, to um, have a water barrel and, and collect a lot of this water, especially if you could amass a few of them. Uh, in a few weeks when the water has stopped, you can, you can water your garden from things that, that are already standing there that would have been washed away. Next slide. So if you focus here on the, the top right, um, this goes back to the first webinar and this is my, my hand sketch. 
I have built um, quite a few wetlands over the last uh, decade and a half. And uh, this is one of the bigger ones that I built, which is, you can see in the drawing, it's a multi-stage. It, it has a high reservoir, which, which flows into a trickle, which attracts uh, migrating songbirds early in the morning. They'll listen for that sound. I, I once had 10 black-throated blue warblers that showed up in this trickle. Uh, because they were listening for water, they've been migrating all night, they're tired, they wanted to drink, they knew there would be insects around if there was running water. And then, of course, a dragonfly cell, which I call the top right there, where um, fish wouldn't be present. So basically, we want to stick to the plan and remember that when we're building this, and I can't possibly tell you how to build a wetland right now, but I fumbled through it for a few years and eventually got the hang of it. And you, you could hire somebody like me or, or you know, uh, try halfway, you know, do, do part of it yourself. And, uh, but the, the key thing is that when you get that water level, you want to have it right in the bottom right there. You can see how I'm putting rocks in and there's actually still liner exposed that you're going to be uh, covering up all of that liner, but the rocks and the water level eventually will be at the height of what your ground is. And to make this as natural as possible, if you look at the bottom left there, this is actually a sandy habitat, and I just finished this for my friend Bari. So you'll see sand all around the rocks, which isn't very natural for sure, but you could see a wetland like this somewhere else. But by adding other rocks in and little rock gardens, you can start to make it more natural and then really capitalize on having water around for wildlife, and you'll attract so many things. And then I put the, uh, the perspective of the reservoir in the top left photograph there. So if you're going to do a waterfall, you have to build a tiny little pond at the top where the water gets pumped up from the main pond and then it, it will overflow the reservoir and you'll keep the water in the pond. Next slide. And so um, this is what mine looked like at the very beginning. And uh, this is very similar to the one I just showed you. There are many different elements here, um, you know, digging in uh, in that far right corner is where I was filling up the water where the dragonflies um, eventually now come and lay every year. That, that dragonfly species actually lives under the water for eight years as a nymph. And uh, it doesn't turn into an adult until eight years being this underwater predator feeding on mosquitoes. And actually the flowing water here, not just in the main waterfall, but in the trickle and the whole system will actually keep mosquitoes out. They don't like flowing water at all. Uh, but the important thing to look at here is that I still have liner exposed here uh, where that main waterfall is. You can see the black area. You're going to want to cover all of this and make it look, you know, as natural as possible. But it's not always achievable. So you have to kind of accept that, you know, you can tell that you created this. The next slide shows um, this same wetland on the same day in the bottom right, but from a different angle showing that trickle coming down to the dragonfly cell without any uh, fish in there because dragonflies will be eaten by fish. And uh, then it overflows into what I call a biological filter. But this is just to show you that with a little bit of patience and kind of re-engineering things as you go along or, or enlisting help when you need it, that you will get plants established. And like I said, 25 species of, of wetland plants and a few woodland plants in here. And I am each year finding new insects, as, as Pete has mentioned, that it's critical. These native plants attract insects, which in turn attract larger insects and the birds are there. And then before you know it, the, the whole system starts to really expand. And I actually had a pair of nesting owls uh, screech owls that fed their young from little toadlets that came out of this pond. So it's just mind-blowing the connections that start to happen. Next slide. In this next slide here, I'm showing you uh, some different wetland options. And, and, you know, if you're doing it yourself, this one on the left I built for uh, a, a client. Um, this one was all out of shale, completely different look really small area. So I built it really high and vertically. Uh, you can't see any of the liner. It is actually quite deep and a pretty steep waterfall. So it provided a really nice sound in a small area and totally enclosed so children couldn't get into it. It's a little inset on a deck. Then the top right one there, I wish I could say I built this one. Um, this one goes extensively around this house. It has, um, you know, koi, uh, beautiful Japanese koi in it, which aren't a native fish, but they're spectacular. 
um, you know, the one on the left would probably go nowadays for seven or 8,000, maybe a little more, but the one on the top right, if you're hiring a contractor, which is really deep, and you know, it's, it's probably a $30,000, at least maybe 40,000. The one at the bottom there, which is kind of cut off now, if you go to Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, you'll see um, this big concrete pond, which, you know, they're going for a completely different effect. There are no native plants along the edge of it, but they put native plants in the middle. And actually the woman there that you can just see part of, she was actually a professional photographer that would come there and photograph these dragonflies. And I, I took quite a few pictures of her taking pictures and I went over and I said, do you mind? And she said, oh, please, could I have them? And so I shared them with her and we talked about dragonflies and native plants. So there are many different options that you could look at. And there are a lot of people that you could get help from. And I highly recommend it as, as difficult as, as it is in the beginning, it just attracts so much and it's soothing and calming. So that's it, thanks. All right, I'm gonna close this up as quickly as I possibly can. All right, so um, growing native plants is a wonderful opportunity to learn botany. I call it, grow it growing it to know it um, and What's important to do though, if you wanna learn is label stuff. So here's a wonderful way to label things using rocks um, with your common name or your scientific name, as you prefer. You could even put a French name or an indigenous name in there, why not? Um, it's also important to put signage in your garden to let people like maybe your neighbors know exactly what it is that you're doing because it's not going to look exactly the same as a traditional garden. Next slide, please. Um, keeping good records is a really good way to essentially form a journal um, that documents your entire journey, which will, I promise you, it will last, it will be a, a years long journey and being able to go back and see what things were happening at the same time of year, say two or three or four years ago, turns out to be really valuable. So whether you want to do this using photographs or a notebook or a spreadsheet or painting, who knows? There's lots of different ways to do it, uh, but I highly recommend. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we'll be talking more about citizen science, which is a way for your personal records to become part of um, the academic landscape. Um, this will be covered in the fifth episode of this series, and so I'll just leave that one there for now. Next slide, please. So that's it, folks. That's your eight steps for establishing a wildlife garden. I hope um, you found that thorough and engaging. And with that, we'll just um, wrap this last part up and then get to your Q&A. So next slide, please. We have some resources here. These are a series of books. You're welcome to take a screenshot of this or it will be posted. This recording will also be posted so you can go back to it. This is just how to learn more about this kind of thing. Many different writers have um, encapsulated ideas of native plant gardening and growing wildlife in different perspectives. Next slide, please. More websites to visit to learn more, learn how to identify plants, learn what kind of plants are good for your garden, what sort of pollinators are going to visit certain kinds of plants, etc., etc. Again, this will be posted. Feel free to take a screenshot. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is just really reiterating the point that we made up at the very front. Um, the In the Zone Tracker is essentially a form of citizen science where you can answer questions about your garden and contribute that to our overall learning about how these types of gardens are impacting our landscape. So we we currently have of our, our 3,000 gardeners already registered, we know that a third of them of those gardens, and these include people who don't really know anything about gardening, they're just getting started with this for the first time, one third of them already include native plants, 91% of people already feel connected to nature and want to grow more native plants because it's good for wildlife, and fascinatingly, 68% of gardens are connected to adjacent habitat. So that means they're actually growing that habitat by tacking their garden onto the side of it. So that's wonderful stuff. And if you would like to contribute, put 
you can put your garden on the map and contribute your data to this database. Next slide, please. By registering your own garden at inthezonegardens.ca. And in so doing, you'll also gain access to wonderful free resources um, to learn more. Next slide, I think that's rounding us out. That's us. Me, Ryan, my colleagues, Pete and Ben will be here to answer your questions. Um, I see 19 already in the bank and more probably coming in. So with that, next slide, I believe, is questions. Yeah, let's do it. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so yes, we have, I know we've had a very active chat today too, so I'm going to try to get two questions in both. So if you have questions still, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and if they're for one of specific one of our experts, just indicate that and we can direct it to the right person. Okay. I've already answered about 15. I don't know if the panelists can see it, but um, I just couldn't help myself. So I'm, I'm you know, happy awesome, to ben. let you guys go. Cool. So I'm just reading the questions now. Um, we have a question from Don who says that they installed a pond with a controllable waterfall and a rain garden in their backyard in Toronto two years ago. Um, and there's about 50% natives. They would like to have frogs. Um, so, but they haven't come yet. So how do you get frogs? Well, uh, the best way is to really let them come in. And um, we're often surprised um, how quickly it occurs. Uh, the, the wetland I showed you that was Mathis's, Mathis Natvik, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, we live um, near a natural area that is, there's a four lane highway in between us. And within a, a couple of weeks, he actually got three or four species of frogs. I have a few as well. It could be that your place in Toronto is completely landlocked. And uh, I've heard of some people at development areas that have taken tadpoles, but you actually need a permit to do that. And I don't know if the local authorities would give you a permit, but you could always apply. And um, I have some other ideas that, you know, our emails were there. I'd be happy to answer those um, later because I could probably go on for too long. All right, thank you so much, Ben. And I have two questions here for Pete. Um, they're somewhat related. Um, so the first one is what kind of mulch would you recommend that won't smother um, the home for solitary bees? As you mentioned, a lot of bees are live in the ground. And are there any negative effects um, long-term for using mulch? I'm gonna pass on that because I, I know that uh, Ryan is more of a mulch expert than I, as Sorry. I mentioned earlier, neither myself nor Ben actually use mulch. So Ben, over, uh, Ryan, I'll, over to I'll you. I'll take that one, I'll take it, yep. Um, so mulch, really the way that we are talking about using it in that slide is as a weed suppressor for the very first year of establishment. And it does work for that purpose. It's best to, in, in that particular case, uh, it so happened that a tree went down, a city tree, um, and they came and mulched the thing. And the person who was managing the garden just decided, hey, I've got this pile of mulch here. Why don't I use it to suppress some of the weedy soil in the area? But fully intending to remove that mulch after the first year or so. Because very rightly, as you say, there isn't such a solution um, to having mulch and also having space for ground nesting bees. So um, by all means, um, do use it if you have it for that weed suppression purpose. but after after a year, take it off and leave bare patches. And that's where you'll get the ground nesting bees in. And what would you say, Ben? I mean, the amount of leaves uh, can perform that function, I assume. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I, I, I watch it because I put it on super thick and I, I have uh, things like bloodroot and trillium and may apples and they, they all make it through. Like I, I put in an ordinary amount of leaves because I do have a lawn in my backyard because we play sports and we, uh, we like to have barbecues and entertain. So most in the backyard, while well, the front yard is all native plants, the, the backyard just has perimeter native plant gardens. So all of the leaves that fall in the midsection, I put heavily in those areas. And I wonder if it's too much, 
but those native plants do come up and I don't get any weeds coming up anymore. It looks just like a pristine forest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll, just, I'll take the opportunity here. There was a question I saw that the lasagna method as well, which we, we talked about here, but we didn't have a great photo of it. So figured we'd just address it afterwards. Uh, so this is a method that vegetable gardeners often use to create a vegetable garden patch. Um, in something that was previously a weed patch or a lawn patch. Basically, you put layers and layers of cardboard or newspaper down, and that suppresses anything underneath it, very much like that um, mulch technique would. And then you can cut sort of sections right out of the cardboard or the newspapers and plant your veggies right in there. That does work as well, but um, if ground nesting bees are your main priority, um, I would not recommend that because you're covering up all their little holes. So it, it all depends on what your main priority is for that area. And again, you don't have to have bare, the, the whole thing bare patches. A couple of bare patches here and there will provide lots of habitat for those ground nesting bees. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. We have a question in from Anja who asks, what would you suggest um, for keeping a journal year to year? or sorry, would you suggest keeping a journal year to year for, I'm assuming it's a reference to the citizen science. Oh yeah, yeah, so that was for my section. Absolutely, um, as often as you feel like it really. Um, so what I do, I'm a photo nerd. So I go out with my camera and periodically, I, I like to do this at least once a season, but I aim for once a month, usually at the first of the month, I go out and photograph everything that's growing in my garden and I, I make my photos and I label them. Um, on I do this on Instagram. You can check out my Instagram account if anyone wants. I'll put it in the comments. Um, but this is how I do that. And then I can go back to the previous year at, at, on May 1st and see what was growing. And I've just been doing that for five years or so now. And it's slowly building um, a record of my garden journey. And I definitely recommend that method to others. You've like got to see Ryan on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'll put it in the comments. <laughs> well, in, a, in addition to that, the iNaturalist and iBumblebee and many of those insect and bird things, those are available. You can file your observations. And not only can you then go back once you sent your picture and your date and coordinates, but you can look at uh, what you saw at your point, but also what nearby has been seen for those species. So those uh, are miraculous platforms for online digital diaries, essentially. But I'm old fashioned. I, I don't always rely on the internet. It doesn't work every day. And I just have my annual year round notebooks, which are wonderful reference points that um, don't have to go down a wire. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. We have a question from Laura who is asking if now would be a good time to pull the garlic mustard as it's not in, um, it's not seeding right now. Yeah, totally. I do this every spring in my neighboring High Park. You must uh, remove it uh, before it gets to seed. And the best thing to do is to concentrate your efforts on a given area and get 100% of them and then move on next year to work it out. And you sometimes have to come back two or three years to the same area. But, you know, with your friends, it's a good thing to do uh, with a bunch of neighbors. And actually, if you catch it fresh, it makes fantastic salads. Nice. I did not know that. Mm. Yum. Mm. <laughs> Coming to a gourmet restaurant near you, only for two and a half weeks. <laughs> um, yes, so I agree with that too. It's a good time to pull garlic mustard. And make sure you know what it is though. I remember when I first was yeah, learning yeah. the botany of Southern Ontario, I used to confuse garlic mustard with violets all the time early in the year because their leaves unfurl in the same kind of way. Once you figure it out, the leaves do actually have quite different textures to them. So um, if you're not sure, you can take a test leaf um, crush it up and sniff it. And if it smells like garlic and mustard, then you know what you've got. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say again, thanks to people from other parts of the, the country for, for, you know, being a part of this and uh, apologies for this being Ontario centric. It's just the program started here. We'd really love to expand it and uh, 
we have so many varied, amazing sites with incredible plants across the country. So thanks. Well, maybe, maybe I could add there, Ben, it's a good reminder. I saw a number of questions on that. I mean, our original aim was to pilot this program here and see if it works. It does work for sure. And then export an in the zone tailored to the uh, ecozones across the rest of Canada. And really the same ingredients are now going to go into the rollout of this program in those other areas. Um, what happens uh, when you get east of uh, Rimouski, Montreal, there actually are few, if any, specialist native plant nurseries. So that's the most challenging part to go and find commercial uh, proper plants. Once you get through the rest of Canada and certainly across in Alberta and BC, there's a good array of um, really good experienced nurseries and those are your best sources of advice for which plants to plant in that uh, climate and in that uh, so soil types and habitats. So really uh, the resources, some of them are available. We collated them for this part of Ontario and in a similar way that's how the model is uh, planning to roll out for those other regions in collaboration with other good um, regional groups and some of some master gardeners and horticultural societies too in those parts of Canada. Great um, another question we have come in from Linda is what do you do in the spring to clean your pond? So I'm, this one's for you Ben. Sure, thanks. I'm just uh, answering a question about ticks. I'll finish that in a minute. Um, it, it really depends, right? It, if you have a, a big enough system um, for a while, it can withstand um, uh, taking in a lot of nutrients, uh, but it, it, eventually all ponds will fill in unless there's a big flow with, with a creek or something. And um, you know, sometimes they're expanded by beavers in the wild. Uh, so there are a lot of dynamic factors that we don't tend to have in our urban ponds. So um, I will actually scoop out a good chunk of the leaves. My neighborhood is really mature. And if you're in an old neighborhood like this, the reason why the Swamp Darner picked my site is because they look for forests that have openings in the canopy. And, and that's exactly what my backyard is. But I have to be really careful because uh, a lot of the insects that we're attracting, like I mentioned, this species will live for eight years as an underwater predator, jet propelled, super fast. When I clean out those leaves, I actually sieve through them and I'll find the nymphs or the dragonfly larva, or I'll carefully pick them up, put them in a little container, take out as many leaves as possible, and then return them back into the pond. And, um, you know, I, someone also had a question about algae growing in there. And because I have a biological filter of native plants, it actually removes out uh, the, the waste material from the fish. So, you know, I, I mentioned that I can answer those privately, but there are lots of tricks that you can use. So that's. Okay, Ben, now I want to know your tick answer. Okay, yeah. So the tick answer is that if you... Uh, if you have a garden where you have deer that can come into it, native plants or not, you could definitely have ticks there. Um, if you are, um, some birds will actually carry even sometimes deer ticks and other ticks and drop them off in your garden. Uh, there are even dog ticks, right? So we always have to be aware, especially as the climate is warming, um, and especially in areas where ticks will actually get up on the top of vegetation and then have their little mouth parts waiting just to clasp onto anything that passes by. So a tick check is pretty much mandatory if you're in Southern Ontario and now even as far north as Central Ontario and there's certainly moose ticks and other things, uh, but for the most part it's deer ticks and a couple of others out west that you wanna be really aware of. Do a, a, a tick check afterwards, which in involves of course at least stripping down, having someone help you if that's possible to inspect everywhere um, and you know, in addition to that, you can also evolve to have a tick spidey awareness. And for me, because I spent a lot of time in the field, I can be coming back, driving back from a site where I know there were ticks and I'll pull over and I'll reach back into my back under my shirt and have a tick. So you can actually feel them moving, but not all the time. So it really is critical because you don't want Lyme's disease. You don't want um, spotted rocky mountain fever or something like that. There are a lot of things you can get. So be really aware. Uh, 
you can't really be overly cautious except know that you know driving to the store is a risk because you could get in a car accident so don't stop gardening or tell people that you know to don't go in nature because of ticks because we accept risks all the time mm -hmm. and also just to add to that the question that i saw was do native which native plants attract ticks and that's not the right question because there right. aren't any native plants that actually attract ticks they just they climb up any tall vegetation so i've actually gotten the most ticks personally walking through either agricultural fields or cultural meadows that are full of mostly cold season grasses that are non-native and it's just it's a matter of vegetation height that's it exactly yeah okay great um we're just going to take probably two more questions i know that we've gone over time and we thank everybody for staying on the line you guys are all really excited about native plants and we've gotten tons of questions coming in i'm going to take one from sarah who asked what can someone do if they have seasonal wet areas on their property can they enhance them so that they persist from spring through summer yeah um yeah, you certainly can, especially if it's, uh, you know, you could put in that cross section that you use for a rain garden that's coming from a downspout. And um, just know that when it dries out, you still want to have some plants that can fill in the certain areas. Um, you know, it's challenging because you won't have water sitting there. But if you look in, in our forests, uh, we have a lot of things that are called ephemeral ponds. And I mentioned earlier that I have a dragonfly cell. And the reason why I have that is because fish don't occur there. And when you look at a lot of our woodlands, these ephemeral ponds are critical for things like salamanders to breed. So they'll actually be down in the water table. And when it's early spring, as soon as the, the water has, the snow has melted and there's some ice left, they'll come up to these ephemeral ponds and they'll breed because there are no fish and other predators. And then before um, it all dries up, those eggs will hatch. And then, um, you know, the cycle continues. So it's pretty critical to have ephemeral water. So you could get really creative, do some research, ask an expert and see what you could create because that kind of habitat is critical and it is a wetland. So really important. All right, thank you so much, Ben. And we have one more question we'll take. And this one is from Kevin. He's asked, is there any value in having some turf grass? I get the answer to that question a lot. I'll, the short answer is there is a small value, um, earthworms and dandelions. <laughs> and earthworms are good for some people, fishermen. Um, they also are good for robins that come back early. And dandelions are one of the first things to flower in big seas and they provide some of the large volume early nectar for early emerging bumblebees. So they're not all bad. It's just that there are hundreds of times more species and biomass if you had other diverse uh, native plants there. Mm -hmm, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to add to that, of course, you, it could be a, a benefit to you to have some sort of steppable or picnic area on your property. And if that means you're gonna spend more time outside, then do that. If, if you're not going to spend all that much time there, though, then consider the alternative potential of that space. And the other thing that I would say, I'm really trying to push this one home. It is possible to diversify your lawn. Um, so you could add things to it like wild strawberry that would potentially sort of crawl through. And um, some of the like common blue violet would be an option that would sort of integrate itself. Um, maybe some of the pussy toes, perhaps some pearly everlasting, other kinds of creepy ground covery native plants um, could be a way of maintaining your short lawn where you can go out and walk and picnic and stuff, but also have a biodiverse space. Good answer, guys. <laughs> Yes, yeah, thank you, Ryan. I've just got a poll running right now asking how many of you are currently gardening with native plants. Um, I'll just give another uh, minute for answers to come in. But right now it looks like most of you garden with some native plants. You probably have a mix going on of natives and non-native plants. Um, so let's just here. Um, yeah, so here's what you can see. We've got 61% of you are already gardening with some native plants, which is awesome. 9% um, of you don't have a garden yet, but you're tuning in because you really want to learn and you don't have to be intimidated 
really you can start off with just one native plant and Ryan is going to be telling us on Tuesday how you can actually garden um, in containers. So you can start off with just a couple plants. Um, you can do this whether you have a balcony, a front porch, or a big garden. So check us out on Tuesday with Ryan gardening in small spaces. And we have the rest of the webinars continuing through till the middle of May. So please go to wwf.ca and you'll see on our homepage where you can register for future webinars. Um, and with that, I would just like to thank everybody for joining us today. It was so exciting to have you on the line and talk about how we can really dig into our gardens and every native plant we plant will help wildlife thrive. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye. Enjoy the weather. Woohoo!